Welcome to the XMPP office hours. Today we have a guest, Christopher Bolik, and he's going to present um, building a chatbot on ad hoc commands. Christopher um, is from Soprani.ca. Unfortunately, I had to look what and uh, what domain CA is, but it's Canada for one who also didn't know. Uh, sorry for that. <laughs> but yeah, welcome, Christopher. Maybe you can tell a little bit about yourself and um, yeah, what you're doing and maybe how you came to XMPP. I think that's always interesting. <laughs> sure. There's a, a whole collection of things that people might be familiar with. So I've been working with uh, a few people <laughs> um, from, so the, there's Sopranica uh, or Sopranica.ca, uh, Sopranica from, which is a collection of of technologies that are all based on XMPP and serve as a series of bridges between XMPP and different things. Most popularly is the uh, cell network. So SMSs, MMSs, and phone calls. And so the specifically, there's a, a company that I'm working with or for called jmp.chat, which I believe has presented here before. Um, and so they specifically have a, a, a what's the, like an account, an association, a partnership with a, a cell provider that makes it so that, yes, thank you, but that makes it so that you can uh, use, basically it provides an XMPP contact for every phone number currently, um, and, and that allows us to, if you have an account with JMP, it allows us to, uh, to, to use XMPP to communicate with people who have a cell phone, basically. It gives you a, a cell, a, uh, it gives every cell phone number an XMPP JID. That's the, that's the gist. So. Okay, right. I think I already stumbled over that and uh, yeah. pretty cool. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Just, just, um, just one thing. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not speaking as Sam um, Witted. I'm just using his account. My name is actually Edward. Uh, I'm Enos, so that everyone knows and is not confused. So I'm not Sam <laughs> Witted. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> just trying to organize here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, um, well, I think that's pretty interesting technology. I think many, many non, let's say, commercial clients use that that way of dealing with their users. So they turn their phone numbers into XMPP uh, IDs in the back, background. Um, that's, I think that's a similar approach uh, doing that there. Mm -hmm. But maybe that's a topic for after, after uh, the talk. Now, Christopher, yeah. please uh, let us know uh, what your experience is with chatbots. And uh, thank you that you're here. Let's go. Yeah. All right, uh, so basically we ran into this interesting situation where we've got these users who have accounts and the there are a lot of things that you might want to configure when you're running a, a micro telecom on XMPP. Um, so like we found like people might want to record voicemails, people want to uh, figure out billing information, they want to see what their usage is because we have usage limits. Um, they want to configure how they receive calls because we support a different, a couple of different ways of that kind of, of doing that kind of thing. Uh, and so, question. yeah. Do you intend to share your screen or is it a, a just verbal talk today? Uh, I'll be sharing my screen at some point. Um, but at this point, what you'd be looking at is just, uh, the, okay, the big blue just, button still. All right. Just sure. Yeah. It is not yet broken. Don't worry. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, yeah, so, the, so what we found was that uh, there's a number of things that people would want to configure. And having an XMPP-based business uh, where people would configure things through HTTP was fine. It works. Uh, but we wanted things to feel a little bit more XMPP native. Um, so basically what we did is as we started implementing a number of these configurable account features, rather than 
building them as a web front end that talks to the same database. We built it into the app. So I'll show that. And I'm going to share my whole screen uh, just because I'm, I might be switching windows uh, from time to time. So hopefully people can see something. I'll just make this big. It's going to be a little distracting. Uh, what if I just pop up a terminal over top? Uh, there we go. <laughs> OK. Um, so if I go down here, chiagram.com, that's a third name in the collection of things. Uh, but chiagram.com is the, the transport. And JMP is the company who does the cell phone bridging in particular. So uh, if I go down here to chiagram.com, and this is just the normal ad hoc command flow. Uh, I'll talk about the bot in a second. Um, so I can run this. There's a number of different uh, commands that I can choose here. Uh, this register with backend one is provided by Chiagram. And the rest of these are being forwarded through Chiagram by JMP. So this is basically the command I would use to set up that jmp.chat is my backend provider. And then the rest of these, like what my phone number is and how my calls are handled and all those kinds of things are now changing features of my jmp.chat account because that's where my number lives, my actual cell phone number that is. So in, in this kind of XMPP native way, uh, as though, you know, I, mean, I know that there are different opinions on ad hoc commands, but you know, I can come in here and I can like look at my JMP number and it'll tell me my JMP number um for example uh and i can go to configure calls and it can say you know how many seconds should i ring before voicemail do i want my voicemails to be transcribed should i go to should my phone calls come into uh my jid over like with jingle or should it go to a sip account those kinds of things so kind of normal account configuration settings, but here rather than some sort of, you know, accounts.jmp.chat web front end. So there's a problem though, which is that uh, not every XMPP client supports ad hoc commands. In fact, many of the popular ones don't. And that's fine, but if we were, if we were later, we want to build our own client that that has some of these forms kind of more natively built in and it'll use the same interface. So it'll still be speaking using ad hoc commands as their API, but it'll be like a register button which goes through the registration flow rather than you know right click on chiagram.com, click uh, execute ad hoc command. So we want to build a client that has those, that uses ad hoc as the way it communicates with the backend service, but we haven't yet. And in the meantime, we can't just tell people you can't configure your account if they're, if they're not using a very particular set of clients. So we ran into this kind of gap where either we provide this interface, the ad hoc command interface for the clients that support it. And then every other client either has to like talk to support or we have to rebuild every interface in a different way to support those clients. Um, and so instead what we did is kind of like rebuilding those interfaces, but instead what we did is we built a chatbot interface to any ad hoc command. Uh, now, technically it's a subset of the, of the commands, like the, the parts of the standard that we are using, but it's most of it at this point. Um, so I'm gonna show that. Uh, so what I can do if I instead pull up I don't actually know if people say Dino or Dino. I say Dino most of the time. Uh, so if I pull up this one, this one does not have ad hoc command support. But you can see that in here, if I type help, it'll do exactly the same thing it did before uh, over in, in the command execute command in Gadgem, which is it went out and it fetched the list of commands and presented them here to me, uh, where this one, again, this one is being provided by Chiagram and the rest of them are all being provided by the JMP is being forwarded through it. And from here I can run them. So I, you know, I can run 
number display, and it will tell me my phone number, just the same as it did in Gadgem. Um, I can run. Uh, oh, and, and then also, just this is just kind of an ease of use thing, but we also support unambiguous prefixes. So I can also just kind of get the num, and then it'll figure it out because typing is typing. Um, uh, yeah, and so I, that same kind of configure config. Oh, but that's close enough. Uh, so basically, here's the kind of the crux of it is, so here's the form that it that it presented from the kind of native interface. And then here is the, the chat interface down here. So it, it gives you a little bit of help text every time because some people, because we're making something up. So we have to kind of build a, a text-based protocol with the user. Um, so it says you can leave something uh, at the current value by saying next. You can return to the main menu by saying cancel at any time. And then enter is seconds to ring before voicemail, current value negative one, which lines up with this form, seconds to ring before voicemail, negative one. Um, it also shows the description text, which is what this shows when you hover over it. One ring is approximately five seconds. Negative means ring forever. So I can go down here and I can type next because negative one seems fine. It'll show me the next thing, voicemail transcription, current value yes, which is the checked. Um, one of the things that we have to deal with in an interface like this versus a, a more tailored interface, like you know a GUI interface, is validation. So for example, if I type, uh, I haven't tested this recently. Hopefully, I didn't break this <laughs> on the most recent deploy. But uh, if I type like, you know, hello or something, um it says oh no no i i don't know what you just said please give me yes or no and i say okay in that case yes you know send me voicemail transcription please it moves on to the next question uh this is a multi-select list so basically it's saying forward calls to one jabber id the current value or two sip account which which of those do you want um and again if i type next it'll use the current value i'll just say uh let's just say one and then configuration saved uh, which is the same as if i click execute here so that's basically the gist um yes yes i want to cancel that's basically the gist um there are other things that i can do in here like uh, usage which dumps out a big list of all of the messages that this test account has sent over the past month um some of them are a little bit, so like the number display, for example, just shows a number. Uh, the credit cards one, um, I don't have a credit card attached to, to this account. Uh, so what it does is it just sends me a link that says, go over here to the web to manage this. This one we unfortunately have to do with the web because the credit card provider, like we don't want to be accepting credit cards over XM, credit card information over XMPP because there are standards about not doing things like that. So in this case, it, it this basically bounces us out to a web page that has an iframe through to our credit card provider. So you can fill in the details in their protected environment. Uh, and then by the time, once you've done that and you come back here, there'll actually be a new command in the help list for you know, adding balance based on the credit cards and stuff like that, which you can do entirely within XMPP after you've vaulted your credit cards through this web link, which is why it sent me that. Um, so that is basically the interface. That's that's how we're turning these uh, these things that are. I mean, the standard is very. It's very clear that the standard is meant to power a GUI. Um, it's not technically written to require it, but it, there's definitely a, an implication in a lot of the ways that the standard is written. They're like, you should show something, for example, a select box with, you know, multiple options here. Um, but uh, we've managed to mostly turn those all into something that would kind of make sense to handle in text. And uh, by doing that, it means that, you know, basically any XMPP client can send text. That's kind of the whole point. Uh, and so, so, so basically, any any client that someone brings, uh, whether it has ad hoc support or not, can now use these. And and I just want to be clear, you know, we didn't rebuild 
a similar interface where we said, you know, enter seconds to ring before voicemail in the bot. And then we have a similar field on the form that is, and you know, seconds to ring before voicemail. What this bot is actually doing, and I'm, I'll, I'll run through the code a little uh, in case people are interested, but I, I don't expect most people will pick up a lot from it, but I'll show it anyway. Uh, but what we are doing is running the command and then turning the, the fields that are returned in the form to us into text that we send on to the user. Uh, so really, if we, if we, we only have to change this thing once. If we change the configure calls to have a new, a new form or to use different words or whatever it is, uh, it'll the those same changes will be reflected in the for the people who use the ad hoc interface and the people who use the text interface both, uh, which is which is really why we built it this way versus you know rebuilding it. So uh, I'll go through the code a little, but it's in Haskell. Uh, so uh, so there might be a I don't know what people's literacy when it comes to Haskell is, but you know, I'll try my best to show off a little bit of it. Um, can people read this? If not, someone speak up. Okay. Uh, so here, for example, oh, and this code's all open source, by the way. Um, we have an advantage here where chiagram.com is where this code lives. Chiagram lives in between the customer who is sending XMPP stuff that needs to be bridged somewhere and the JMP side who is holding phone numbers. And as a result, when people talk to us, we can man in the middle of them because they are talking to us to talk to their backend already for other reasons. And so basically, when people send a message to us, we can turn that into a command that goes to the backend. And then when it comes, when the response comes from the back end, we can turn that into text to send to the user on uh, to the client on the front end, uh, which is what allows us to kind of sit in between and provide this kind of interface. So here we're in a an ad hoc session. We have a bunch of arguments. Um, mostly we don't need to care about those. This is kind of the most important part, which is that there's a a message in the body, and what we do is we here we uh, are we we query the command list so this basically goes out to uh, the the back end that this person has chosen so in this case jmp.chat and it figures out what commands they have and then assuming that there are commands we add our internal commands onto the end and then we send them through to this ad hoc bot run command function here and then at some point, that's going to get us a reply, which we're going to uh, do something with. And if none of those things match, then we send the help text here. So for example, if I come in here and I type uh, uh, boop, it'll send me the help text, um, which is because it went through. And it basically, it couldn't find which of the commands that are available this matched to. Woo, uh, matched to and so it just sent the help text instead. That's basically the idea here. Um, so here in the ad hoc run command, we we are passing through a bunch of methods that are the methods that we use to send messages out to the user uh, that are provided from some abstraction further up in the code, uh, and also to send IQs out to the back end, and also to get messages from the user. So this is like uh, you know basically it blocks until it or it doesn't block it sleeps in a asynchronous way until it receives a message from the user that they've typed and so it passes all these things through to the ad hoc bot run command function um so this thing is a big ball but most of it is is trying to figure out what all the commands are and it Putting in the node name, like basically um, auto-completing the node name based on the prefix, as I mentioned. Uh, all the real logic lives down here in send and respond to. Oh, and then there's this like send uh, intro that just says like, hey, you can click next and that kind of thing. But send and respond to is where most of the magic works. Uh, so here we've gotten, we've executed the command at least one time, and we've received the IQ back from the ad hoc command on the backend side. And 
we have a big case statement here where we're basically saying like, okay, if this is a result and there is a payload and there are notes in the, which is a, one of the elements that ad hoc can use to convey just normal text information. Then what we should do is we should build an SMS from the, from, from, like for the component, we should thread the message. So this just adds the XMPP uh, thread so that if you have a, one of the UIs that supports threading, the response will come in the same thread as the request. Um, and then this will basically send that to the user all wrapped around with the various XMPP things that we need. Um, and then we go over all of the notes and we send them every one of them. That's basically what this is doing. And then we also have some stuff where it says if we are executing, so we've sent them all the notes. If we're executing, then we should wait for some sort of action to happen. Uh, we use those in registration, I think, somewhere where we send them some notes and then we wait for something. Um, but there are other elements on our case statement. So for example, here, uh, if we have a form in our payload, so that is a, a, we've been presented with a form. This is a result and there's a form. And uh, then what we do is we call this render result form. And what that does is basically another big case statement, which says, if this is instructions, uh, it goes over all of the, the elements of the form, all the children of the form. If there's instructions, then it um, will concat all of the elements together. If it's a field, it will dump the values out. Um, and uh, things like that. So this is this this one here because it was a result. This is our uh, we've been given a structured response basically. Um, so that would be like the, uh, the so when when someone asks for their configuration information for like their SIP account or something like that, um, this will return the fields of the form presented as like field name colon field value and stuff like that. Um, we have another one here. So this one is not a result, but it is instead uh, a, a form that we're asking them to fill out. Um, so what we're, what we're gonna do here is if I scroll through a little bit, this is where we get to the kind of main answer form stuff. So here we have a, a select statement that says, again, if it's instructions, I send the text out to the user. If it is, uh, if the form field is of type list single, then I call the ad hoc list single function. If it is list multi, I call the list multi functions. These are basically my renderers that are turning the form field into text that gets sent out to the user. And in all of these, I'm passing through the method that we should use to send a text out to the user and the method that we should use to get a response back from the user. Uh, and that's important, and I'll talk about that in a sec as to why that's important. Um, but just to like look into one of these, just like let's say this one, because uh, or list single, that's the one we saw earlier where it was asking, where do you want your phone calls to come from? Do you want them to come into your Jabber ID or do you want them to come into your uh, SIP account? So basically what we're doing is uh, we bundle these all up with the list one to N. Uh, we find which value is the current value. We go over all of the current text uh, or all, all of the options text values and we append the current value onto the one that is the current value. Um, and then we, we say which number, we join up all of that text by new lines and we send it out to the user using this send text method. That's basically it. Um, the send text method is internally uh, asynchronous which means it sends out to the user and then this method just kind of continues even though it doesn't actually uh, ruin things. Um, and then here, we, we just get the message back. We run until parse. We've got a parser down here that parses out numbers. So basically this will just ask again and again until they give us something that looks like, uh, until it looks like something that we expect as an answer to the question we asked them. And then when we do, we get the value and we return out a, an XMPP field with the var set to the var of the question that we asked. And that gets returned out as an answer to the, like as a, as a field that goes out to our response. And so what we do 
in our big case statement here is we basically go over every field, we run this method, which will block internally until it returns some sort of value. We populate that into an XMPP form response, which then gets returned from this function. Uh, and that goes to here where we actually send that out to XMPP on the backend side. We basically, we pretend that we filled out the form using some sort of a GUI, for example, and we send that out to the back end. And then that will give us some sort of response, which we then use to call this method again. And we recurse down uh, forever, basically, until the, until the back end stops sending us answers uh, or it stops sending us uh, forms that are request that are in the executing state. Because once it gets to a response, we stop recursing. That's basically how the whole thing works. Um, so the only other thing that I'm going to say there is the, about the code is that it's important that we pass in to our handler the, the method that they use to get a response because we handle things like cancellation in at this top level. So all of our different form elements could just say, uh, you know, tell me your value, whatever that is. Uh, and just tell me what the user says. But if the user says cancel, that actually doesn't end up in there. That kind of bubbles up here and breaks the chain, which uh, allows people to get out of a form because that's one of the other disadvantages of a text-based interface compared to a GUI is that it has fewer buttons. Um, and so in the same way that we have to handle text validation to make sure that the response that they typed is the kind of response that we were expecting for the kind of field that we're asking them to fill out. We also have to handle sing things like if I do config again and I end up in this form and I realize like actually uh, I don't actually want to change this. I can type cancel uh, and it'll just abort the whole thing. Uh, and I don't have to have each form element handler handle cancel i can handle that for the form as a as like a as a concept that basically bubbles the exception out uh it's not an exception but it works similar um and says okay like we're canceling this now i'm going to send the cancellation to my back end like they would if i clicked cancel in the gui so that they know it's canceled and then i'm going to tell the user okay uh we canceled that um we handle next in a slightly similar way where uh like if i was to do config again and I just wanted to move past this. I could just say next. Um, and we don't have to have each thing handle next means negative one or something like that. Uh, they can all just kind of say, oh, if you type next, then ignore whatever the form handler was going to do and just build a field that is exactly the same as the field we were given in the request, uh, which means the value will, will be maintained. Um, so yeah, that's basically how we built it. Uh, there's a whole uh, register flow, which my account can't really show. But uh, but that's kind of where, like, in, in that case, there's a lot of different questions and, uh, and like, you know, lists. And, you know, do you want to pay, you want to, do you want to register your account using credit cards or Bitcoin? And then, you know, they pick that and then it'll tell them the Bitcoin address and then they can go out and do it. So it's a whole uh, wizard. Um, but it's all built with this same thing. We're like, we didn't build a chat wizard interface. We built an ad hoc command interface that the chat can just represent. Um, so that's that's been really useful for us. And so our hope is that, again, like I said at the beginning, later we're planning on building a client which has some of this stuff more, more baked in, like the registration, or it'll, it'll look more native. But but in the end, we'll have only implemented it once. Uh, we'll have only implemented it once, which is we'll have implemented the ad hoc command, and then we'll have our flow and the ad hoc command flow and the text flow, which are all running the same wizard if, from the perspective of our server. So that's basically the, the idea. I'm going to mute real quick. Uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask those. Thank you very much, Christopher. Well. Um... Are there any questions you can write up in the public chat? We had one comment. So uh, Singh Podima uh, was saying, um, our hope is our app to evaluate um, eventually use and embedded web view for this step. I think it was in the very beginning when you're explaining that. Maybe one initial question from my side. 
do you have a or like takeaways when building uh, a chatbot um, with or without a talk commands? I think that's actually the point, right? Well, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's. Uh... I actually kind of like it, honestly. Um, there are some complexities, like I said, you have to be a little bit more careful with validation. Uh, it's a lot easier. I mean, earlier on, we had a problem where, you know, people would write next and we weren't expecting it and it would fill in next as a value for something that was expecting, like, how many seconds do you want to ring, right? So so those kind of learnings were relatively quick, uh, whereas with a a... GUI interface, by now people have been doing those long enough that like this is a number picker and you can only put numbers in it. Or like, you know, there's not really an easy way to screw up a a list, uh, like, a, like a radio button list in a GUI because the, you can only, the user is forced to pick one of these items. Um, whereas in text, they can send anything. And so we had to be a lot we had to be somewhat careful in like what kind of responses do we expect? What kind of responses should we tolerate? Um, those kinds of things. Uh, but the interface after that I felt is relatively natural. Like I, I actually enjoy interacting with the bot when I need to configure stuff or even when I'm testing um, because my hands are already on the keyboard basically. <laughs> uh, and so it's actually like quick and easy to, to enter things I find. Uh, the other problem with a bot compared to like with a text interface compared to a uh, GUI interface is that we can only show one thing at a time. Uh, the, the users who have the whole GUI can see like, you know, like in the example I showed, you could see like three fields at the same time, and they could think about each one in connection with the others, and they could make different choices before they finally click, like, go to the next page. Whereas in the text interface, we ask them, how many seconds do you want to ring? And they, and then they have to give us an answer before they can see what the next question is. Um, so at some point, we talked about maybe, like, dumping the whole content to the form and then asking them each question. But in the end, it seems like it actually isn't that much of a problem. And especially with the ability to use cancel, we might build the ability to go back a question at some point. But at this point, the ability to use cancel, most of our forms aren't that long. It's kind of easy to just use cancel to bail out and then start again if you absolutely have to. Um, so it's definitely a different kind of interface than, and, and we have to be a little bit careful when we're interacting or when we're writing for it to make sure that you know, it, that we're not going to be doing anything particularly strange that's going to upset uh, other users. But, oh, um, but uh, yeah, uh, as for Unicode or Emoji, no, we haven't exp explored that yet. Um, there might be some Unicode that we could use to, but for now, um, you know, asking people to fill in a text box or select from a list is, like we've had to be careful, but so far I don't think there's been anything that's been really obviously confusing. I hope not, at least. Uh, but theoretically, it's possible, and we could try. <laughs> uh, but you know, but uh, so far I don't think we've seen a time where it would have definitely helped. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Thumbs up and thumbs down, that, that kind of thing on yes or no questions. Um, like, if that was the kind of thing that everyone already expected to work, it would be good to make it work. But probably the people who are just going to guess it uh, is, um, like, like, like it, it, we could include it as an Easter egg, but it, I don't think anyone would say, like, oh, you know, it was super confusing that I couldn't send a thumbs up to a Boolean question. Um, but but supporting it is relatively easy, which is nice. You know, the it's in the end, it's just text. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's been interesting. We're gonna keep, you know, it's still our plan, and uh, it's been interesting to get used to. But yeah, it so far hasn't been like difficult per se. It's a comment. It's only way nicer than building a whole second chatbot. <clears throat> yeah, that's true. Because really, I mean, if we if we were trying to represent 
the like the, the kinds of questions one asks a user are pretty standard by now, right? We're we're looking for some text or some numbers, or uh, or for you to pick an item out of a list or tell me yes or no, right? Um, and so all of the complexity that we would have needed for answer validation and UI on how to do multi-select and those kinds of things, those those kinds of problems are the same problems we would have had to solve if we were building a kind of bespoke chat UI specifically for the one or two interfaces we had in mind at the time. But now that we've built those in a generic way, anytime we want to introduce a new kind of form, we can just uh, build a new ad hoc command. It contains all those elements and the chat bot will, that the chat bot will just work. Like there, the surface area on complexity that we had to add specifically because we were going to be interacting with ad hoc commands was pretty much none. Um, almost all of the situations, all of the complexity was in the same things we would have had to build if we were just building a chat UI from scratch that did a specific thing. So yeah, in that sense, I think it is it's it is much nicer than building a whole second chatbot UI. Uh, and now we don't have to, you know, uh, like make changes to two or three or four APIs in lockstep with each other. We build one and the rest of them follow, which is which is really nice. And And as much as the spec for ad hoc commands kind of implies a GUI, it is nice that that like like this kind of thing where there are different UIs that can both use the same RPC essentially is is kind of the point of the ad hoc commands being a standard with forms and stuff, right? Um, it's it's nice that they have this spec of questions that one answers and the way of responding to them so that we could uh, have multiple different interfaces that are all powered on the same RPC interface, basically. So, you know, it, it's it's actually it's pretty nice. Maybe in the meantime, uh, so I understood you are prof uh, professionals working with XMPP. Um, why did you choose over the, this technology? Uh, as soon as I unmuted, you decided to bark. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> so, do you mean XMPP or ad hoc yes. commands? Uh, XMPP, XMPP in general. Oh, uh, I mean, that's just because we like it, honestly. Um, we like XMPP as a standard. <laughs> yeah, uh, we like XMPP as a standard. Um, we like the, the extensibility of it, which we're using heavily here, obviously. Uh, and so, and we already had, because we were already users of XMPP, we already had XMPP interfaces, we had clients, favorite clients and stuff like that. And so with a lot of the modern things like um, like MAM and Carbons and stuff like that, which support having multiple clients, it really made it easy when we wanted to have, you know, the ability to send messages to a cell phone number, like to text someone who is not an XMPP user and have all the different devices sync and have the message history sync between devices and those kinds of things. Uh, it really made the most sense because we already had clients that supported a lot of those features. We just have to kind of do that last leg of turning an XMPP stanza into an SMS and then all the rest of it just works. So that was basically why we were already uh, fans and it already provided a bunch of benefits that we otherwise would have had to build. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I don't see more questions that that just that uh, one listener was happy that uh, to listen to this talk because he didn't even know what a ad hoc commands were. So I think that's also great. <laughs> yeah, I just posted a link so you can, if you're just interested in ad hoc commands itself, you can look at XCP. Uh, 50, and that should do the first, uh, I'll give you some more information on that topic. Um, and I think this uh, is also interesting to implement, that someone must implement their own chatbot now. So I think that's great, Christopher, that you put some motivation for the people there. 
Uh, thanks, Christopher, for posting the code. Yeah, I, I don't know if these comments get synced out in whatever recording it is, but uh, in case <laughs> I just put a link to the things for the in the comments for the people who are here and otherwise, hopefully that'll get disseminated somewhere. <laughs> Since this is open source code. So if people uh, want to ask further questions, is there a way to reach out to you? Yeah, uh, there's a chat room. Uh, which I will drop a link to in the in the, in the chat. <laughs> um, the chat room is for the whole uh, Sopranica family of products. Um, so I'll, I'll drop a link to that over here. It's it's a muck um, that people can join if they have any questions about the code. Because of the the overlap between people who are interested in Chiagram, the people who are interested in Sopranica, and the people who are interested in JMP.chat in particular. Uh, are is pretty high. Uh, sometimes there will be people there speaking specifically about like JMP, but um, but in the end they're all pretty similar, and so feel pe people should feel free to join that chat. And if they have any questions about Chiagram or anything like that, there that's where we will be. Great. Yeah, just for our listeners, it's discuss at conference.soprani.ca. Yep. Um, well, yeah, yeah. I think your dog is also excited about uh, XFPP and the chat. Oh, box. yes, yes. <laughs> She's very excited about ad hoc commands. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> I hope that wasn't too loud for everyone. Sorry if it was. No, yeah, it's, it's all right. <laughs> we all know the situation currently. Huh? No worries. I like dogs. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, if there are no further questions, I think. Um, that I would call it for today. Um, then, Christopher, thank you very much for your talk and also for uh, yeah coming up with. Oh, yeah, thank you for hosting. Yourself. Sure. And yeah, then hope hopefully we see you again with some other um, well adventures in XMPP one day, and um, or maybe a revisit of that topic is also fine for us. And other than that, if everyone anyone else is interested. Um, please uh, sign up. Please let us know if you can. You don't need to, but it, it, it helps a lot to, to announce the, uh, and organize a bit. Um, there's one comment. Maybe let's see if there's a final question. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Christopher. All right. 